Hello and welcome to the latest Odds Checker betting podcast. Lots to discuss on this week's show, including, of course, the King George VI and Queen Elizabeth II stakes, a fantastic event. The likes of Enable, Adair, Highland Real, Tabruda, Nathaniel, and that brilliant winner, Harbinger, have been recent winners since 2010 alone. And to discuss all the action on Friday and Saturday at Ascot, we've got two top maestros in the building for you. First off, Ed Quigley. Ed, how are you? I'm very well, thanks, Danny. How are you doing? You good? Yeah, not too bad. Thank you, Ed. Did you uh, survive the heat wave just about? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yep, sat there in a few ice cubes. Um, yeah, well, until we ran out of ice, and then um, <laughs> that was about it, really. But no, all good. Yeah, just got to try and sort the garden out now. But um, <laughs> otherwise, uh, yeah, all good. Thanks. And from across the Irish Sea, of course, very busy period coming up in Ireland. Of course, we've got the Galway Festival, the seven-day festival at Barry Bally Brit to look forward to next week. But first off, Johnny, how are you? You looking forward to to, to all the action this weekend, Johnny Ward? Absolutely, Dan. Uh, good to chat to you, lads. Um, just fresh from, I went to Galway for uh, a little weight launch on on Monday. Um, it took me about eight or nine hours to get home, despite the fact the train only takes two and a half. So I'm already getting into the spirit of Galway. A lot of watering going on there. It was very warm on the day. Um, and obviously, we had a brilliant renewal, um, a brilliant finish anyway to the Oaks at the weekend. But the, the main horse scratch from that, I think, really helps us to uh, build up the big race that we're going to talk about Saturday. Yeah, lots to, of course, look forward to with the King George. But first off, before we have a look at Saturday's card, we're going to have a look at Friday. There's some good action at Ascot there. I think seven race card gets underway at 155 and finishes at 525. At the time of recording here on Wednesday, the going is good to firm, good in places, and there is watering taking place. But there are showers forecast at the Berkshire venue on Friday. Just a reminder, before we get a couple of selections from the guys for the opening day, please do head to the Odds Checker app. It's the best place to find tips, uh, best offers, and also, of course, the best odds guaranteed. And make sure you do check out the likes of Andy Holding, who will have plenty of tips over the weekend, along with uh, a glittering array of other Odds Checker tips. So I think the first race we wanted to have a look at is the 305 is quite a competitive event, the John Guest Racing Brown Jack Candy Cap. Uh, twenty thousand pounds guaranteed over an extended one miles over extended two miles uh, for this event and five runners go to post including the progressive mostly cloudy johnny i'll start with you the 305 anything that makes appeal in this event this race i found quite tricky so i have a, a fancy in the novice race before this but uh, it'll be it'll be interesting to see how the betting works out here because mostly cloudy um, it, it actually looked like he was probably going to be beaten for the first time in this winning run at Doncaster the last day at uh, three weeks ago. Really pulled it out in the last in the closing stages. Um, there are a couple of horses here that essentially, um, particularly uh, Speedo, Speedo Boy, who would be more than good enough to win this if if he if he could bounce back. He was a course and distance winner uh, last summer. That was his first win in ages. He's kind of been um, a horse that's obviously had his issues. Now, they've given him a wind up. Um, if he were to bounce back to anything like his best, he would 100% win this race. So I'd probably chance him if um, you could get sort of favourable odds. Because I think, you know, you've obviously mostly Cloudy stepping up in class and the Williams horse be more than good enough at this level. But you are taking a chance. He's won once in about three years, uh, but does like around Ascot. So it would be, I'd be looking for the prices on it, but I'd probably chance speed oh boy if I could get a reasonable price on the base that the wind off might work. It would need to. Ian Williams doubly represented in the five runner affair. Uh, what about yourself, Ed? Yeah, I'd be with Speedo Boy here. Yeah, definitely. I think he's he's worth a poke. He won this race last year. He's won it twice, in fact. Uh, back in 2018, he landed this as well. I mean, you look at it from a handicapping perspective. Uh, I think it was he won it off 93 back in 2018, and he was 87 last year, and he comes in here off 89. So he's not impossibly handicapped on the pick of his form. Clearly thrives at this venue. Uh, disappointing when last team has had the wind operation, say C and D form handicap to go well. Ian Williams team after a bit of a quiet spell as well. They're back in winners, uh, winners enclosure a bit, haven't they? I think they've had four winners from their last 12 runners at the time of recording. So um, they are back in form. And I think, yeah, we could all be a bit ageist at times. And naturally, mostly cloudy is the younger progressive legs. But it uh, does have a bit more on his plate in this company, I think. And I wouldn't be ruling out the claims of the old boy. Uh, the eight-year-old speedo boy here. So, yeah, he's my selection. OK, course and distance winner for Richard Kingscott and Ian Williams. 340 next up, £30,000 John Guest Racing Handicap. Arguably the pick of the, of the action on Friday, over 12 furlongs. Interesting runner here is the Whitmaster for Ryan Moore and Gary Moore. Won its last four starts. You've also got Wanda Montalban, who's arguably the class act in this and also boasts course and distance winning form. Ed, start with you this time. Anything in the 340 that grabs your attention? 
No, not really. Happy to sit this one out. I think the Whitmaster is going to be short enough. Uh, but who I take the Whitmaster on with, I'm not really sure. So all in all, uh, went round the roundabout, came back to where I started. So no, I'm I'm happy to swerve this one, Danny. Johnny, what about yourself? Yeah, Gary and Ryan teaming up. Uh, it'll be interesting to see what sort of um, Ryan has a nice book of rides uh, over the course of Ascot. Uh, again, this is a bit similar. A horse stepping up in class. Wandel Montalban. I mean. This horse was sent off four to one in the Copper House Stakes at Ascot. When I would wonder if he handled the ground, he's he's but he's Luke De Vega. There was a question mark about stamina as well. He's stepping up to a mile and six. He didn't get home, but it looked like there was more to it than that. Um, because when he won the time before, his trainer said they knew he would handle the ground. That was good ground. So I think I think it'll be a question of whether he'll handle the ground, and they definitely would want it to be good or softer. I think my selection here is actually Jeremiah. This horse is quite interesting. They put blinkers on him the last day at Sandown when he travelled quite well. That was his debut for Alan King. They've left the blinkers on. He faded out of that. Probably needed the run. Um, but again, is a course and distance winner uh, for his previous trainer. So I'm not sure how he ended up with Alan King um, in the first place or what the thinking was behind that. But it wasn't a bad one. And I think Tom Arcan has taken over. I think he might be interesting. Again, like our selection in the last race, he's just come down the weights to uh, a mark that definitely gives him a chance. Likes Ascot. I think he ran badly last time. Will appreciate stepping up to a mile and a half. Okay, interesting. Jeremiah Allen King, of course, has probably a nervous weight with Goodwood next week. He could do with some mm-hmm. rain if Trushan is going to run. But Jeremiah, the pick for Johnny there. 4.15, the Lady Amateur Riders Trophy, one of the most interesting races on the card. You've got the likes of Becky Smith, Fern O'Brien, Brody Hampson and Rosie Marchison all riding. Trey Fleur, of course, has some smart French form back in the day. But in this race, anything that is of, is of appeal here, Johnny? No, I leave this one to Ed. Um, and uh, yeah, I'd like to kind of. I mean, these races we've had. We had one in Ireland the weekend as well. They're open to sort of restricted riders. It's 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 definitely going to be. Um, I'd like to follow the 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 Englishman's advice here. It's not one for me. Ed, have you got a strong opinion? No, not at all. Actually, I'm uh, probably getting splinters in my backside in this one. But um, yeah, Alizwa appeared to joy the drop back down in trip with the cheap pieces on uh, when we needed Wolverhampton last time out. I thought it was a pretty good run and the form and that race has actually worked out quite well. Interesting to come down again to down in trip seven for this assignment. Um, watching back some of the footage of Alizwa can be a bit of a free going sort. So naturally, I could see the angle there uh, with this horse. They may have just started to figure out the trip of this individual, you know, been running over an extended 10 furlongs and now, now coming down the distance. But Alice was the most unexposed, progressive type. Archie Watts the stable going well. Uh, but again, um, Lady Amateur Riders Handicap uh, contest here where, as I say, there are a couple of informed rivals against this one, including Carnival Zane. And um, all in all, I just think it's too tricky. So, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to fence it once again in this assignment. The Slingsby Gin Handicap, though, I think Ed has got a fancy in at 450, pounds event, over 12 furlongs. Some interesting runners in this, including Alazar for Ryan Moore and Marcus Dragoning. But where are you in this, Ed? Well, I'm looking at, obviously, at the time recording, no prices. But if you get an each-way double-figure price, shall we say, that horse number 10 on your card here, Tidal Storm, I'd be pretty interested. Ed Walker trains this individual. He's had just the four runs. Uh, ran exclusively over a mile as a two-year-old, and I thought on all three occasions looked outpaced, uh, kind of hitting a flat spot before kind of getting second wind in the closing stages. Well, made a belated seasonal reappearance last month after quite a long time off the track, 200 plus days, and ran like it, to be honest with you, was was very weak in the market and um, just kind of eased out of contention when finishing sixth. However, uh, interesting here looking at the pedigree of this horse, going up in distance, so 12 furlongs, I think that is a big tick in the box. There's lots of stamina in this horse's pedigree. So I wouldn't be shocked uh, if there was a lot more to come. Uh, and in the handicap company here, uh, off 71 has got a couple of pounds back from that seasonal reappearance, which, to be honest with you, I think, I think it was just a, it was an exercise in removing the ring rust, if not anything else. So um, race fitness on the horse's side, up in trip, down a couple of pounds in the handicap. And Tom Marcond. Uh, eye catching jockey booking as well, taking over in the saddle. So, yeah, I think there could be more to come from this horse. I mean, I'm thinking of somewhere around nine, ten to one, uh, that kind of price ballpark figure, real unexposed sort in here. And I just do think middle distances are the future of this horse. So, uh, would be an each way play. Fingers crossed, we've got 11 in there at the moment. Uh, we can keep a few in there. And um, yeah, should be a good each way run for the money. OK, a son of see the moon, of course, the German derby winner. We'll be having some German form also on offer in the King George, of course, on Saturday Tour, K Tour Tasso. Uh, Johnny, a strong view on the 450? 
No, my last selection on Saturday is in the this this uh, is is in the Nova Stakes, um, which is uh, it's a glorified maiden to be honest, because none of these has actually won a race. But Clochess, who's uh, by no name ever, she renews rivalry with Anne Violet. They clashed at Newbury at uh, twenty two days ago, and Clochette was very well back. She was really really unlucky. She was. She travelled like a very good horse. She's by no name ever. She's a lovely pedigree. Um, I think half sister to uh, a decent sprinter as well. Travelled really well. The gaps just didn't appear. didn't appear. She was locked in her run on a couple of occasions. When she did get in the clear, she really ran on strongly. She just passed Anne Violet in the closing stages. I can't see how she doesn't confirm that form. And for any of the newcomers, mainly newcomers in the race, they'll have put up a hell of a performance to beat her. Um, David Probert wrote her, and he's, in fairness to him, when he realised that his chance was gone, even though she was only beaten half a length, he kind of looked after her, which is frustrating if you maybe back the horse today. But if you're, if you, if you didn't back her the last day, now you'll be happier because she's got a nice education. She's clearly smart. She looks like a listed filly at least the way she travelled, plenty of pace, and should definitely be winning this. And at an odds against will be fine. Okay, that's Clochette in the two thirty. Johnny wrapping up the any other business. That's in the John Guest Racing British EBF Phillies Novice Stakes. That's a fifteen thousand pound event over six furlongs that's a quick look at friday's card would that be your nap of nap of friday johnny Clochette? absolutely absolutely yeah um and i get again as, as ed was saying dan just looking for prices but uh, and it's an odds against would do on that and what about yourself ed nap of the day on friday yeah i'm gonna go with the old boy but you know i know you like to get your speedos on danny but um yeah not for me but i'll be with speedo boy on this occasion i think we could have a, a minor upset on the card you can't beat your speedos on holiday, can you, Ed? Come on. <laughs> uh, looking ahead then to the Saturday ultra competitive stuff, of course, we've got the highlight, which, of course, is the King George at 3.35, 1.25 million up for grabs. The racing gets underway, though, at 1.50 and concludes at 5.20. And the opening race might just quickly touch on this. We don't, of course, at the time of recording, have the final decks. But we do have some anti-post betting for the Princess Margaret Keenan stakes in the zoo could make a tick quick turnaround and is the seven to four general favourite on odds checker. Seven to one for funny story. Breeze eight to one along with Glenn Laurel, Kinter and Palm Lily. And it's about nine to one and bigger the remainder. But the likes of Trillium is as short as nine to two on Paddy Power, but 10 to one on Bet365. So do make sure you do shop around. Just a very quick look at this, chaps. Obviously, we don't have the final decks and it's a ultra competitive two year old event. But if Lazoo did turn out quickly, Johnny, would you be with the Rafe Beckett charge here? Yeah, big day for Rafe Beckett. Should take plenty of beating. Obviously, this form, uh, Lazoo's form, ties in with Meditate. Meditate beat Maj, um relatively comfortably, you'd have to say, at Ascot. But then Maj went on and beat Lazoo at Newmarket when Lazoo was sent off 15 days. And to me, the race was a mess, really, for her. She just uh, she just want a bigger field, which I think she will get here and be able to settle better. Plenty of natural pace. And if she can get a good toe into the race, she should take a plenty of beating because she's clearly worth her mark for 101. Having said that, you just would want to see maybe a little bit of a, a little bit more of a prices available because I think you might get there's so many unexposed horses in this. We're obviously not at declaration stage yet, but uh, I think if she turns up, she'll take plenty of beating. Big Dave's disabled, but you probably will be able to get sort of nine four five to two uh, closer to uh, the day. I think. Okay, that's Lazoo, confident for Johnny. It's interesting that Rafe Beckett could also run Funny Story, who is a maiden winner at Newmarket on debut. Uh, Ed, any strong feelings in the Princess Margaret? Not massively. Uh, the, the one thing that was just worrying me with Lazoo is I thought she had a hard enough old race, to be honest with you. Uh, mm-hmm. It's only a fortnight ago uh, to kind of back that up again. Look, I mean, look, she clearly is the class act in the field. Official figures suggest that. But uh, surely does say a whole host of unknown quantities you could potentially line up against, uh, you know, like some Royal Charter, Palm, Lily, as you said, this funny story, Glenn Laurel. Who knows? You know, the maiden winners, some of them won impressively, some of them probably won better maidens, less convincingly. Uh, and they're stepping up in class here. Look, Lazoo, the one to be on form, uh, it's a it's a fair enough turnaround. Uh, in, I mean, was it the 8th, wasn't it, as you ran in July? So a couple yeah. of weeks turnaround. That just get me a little bit nervous. Uh, I think old Frankie de Tori had to, got a bit stuck in. It was a bit of a bit of a battle that day. So, um, yeah, not a race I'd, I'd have any strong convictions on. No, I agree there. I would be taking on Lazoo. Maybe an, a word for Breeze at 8 1 for John Quinn. Wasn't really suited by the race at Pontefract last time out. Just the four runners dwelt to the start, but could prove better than that in time. Next up with the 225, the Long Jean Valiant Stakes, a group free event. £80,000 prize fund over an extended seven furlongs. At the moment, odds checker betting, where you've got three to one favourite is Zambak, but as big as 100 to 30 with Betfred and Bet365. Next in at seven to two is Thunder Beauty. 
Bashkarova seven to two with William Hill, but is shorter in places. Jumbly at nines, nine to two. Ascula at sevens and bigger the remainder. Of course, we don't have the decks again for this, chaps. But anything on paper that makes appeal at this stage in the Valiant, Ed? Yeah, I I would be with a jolly actually. I say I've normally got my long shot goggles on looking for something else, but I think Zambak. Uh, this is the perfect opportunity uh, to make a splash in a group race, isn't it? Really, uh, she won a Haydock Minor event on a penultimate start. Obviously, she wasn't beaten far in that Goodwood listed event earlier on in the season, and then uh, ran a stormer at Royal Ascot last time out. <coughs> excuse me, uh, in the Sandringham where. Look, when you're held up in a field that size and have to come from off the pace, you often are going to be hostage to fortune, aren't you? And so, uh, you know, Jim Crowley had to kind of weave the way through and then it was kind of bumper carts in the closing stages. She was beating a length, but it was a pretty good run. Uh, I think it has to be said. Uh, you could argue Heredia has let the form down to some extent next time out, but there have been plenty of winners come out of Sandringham since. So I think the form has a, a fairly solid look to it. And uh, yeah, I just think she's that unexposed type. A mile here, if anything... You know, I think she likes to be ridden off the pace, but I don't think having to come from the ambulance three to first in a 700 race is necessarily what she wants. And I think the kind of the makeup of this race could suit her a bit better. And yeah, I just think she's the progressive type. There's a few others in here are clearly very good and have achieved more than her to date, but they've had the opportunity to do so. Uh, whereas I think she's the one still on an upward trajectory. And uh, yeah, I, I like her claims is I'm back uh, pr pr progressive type. Uh, Oasis Dream Philly, uh, June Crowley in, should be in the saddle once again for the Roger Varian team. Uh, it's the Roger Varian team again. Um, I remember pre-Royal Ascot talking about Roger Varian. His yard were kind of, you know, fits and spurts in terms of how well they were going. But he's been operating at over 30% strike rate for about the last six six weeks or basically since Royal Ascot, fairly enough. So they've really just started to kind of pick up into top gear now. So, yeah, Zambak for me, uh, a worthy favourite in my view. OK, Zambak for the Crowley variant and Shadwell combination. Johnny? I quite like Thunder Beauty here, actually. She, uh, she's having what, like her fourth start for David O'Mara, but she has an edge over Bashkarova on that running at Royal Ascot, when obviously, in fairness, uh, Saffron Beach was by far the best horse. What was interesting about that run was that um, they held up Thunder Beauty and she travelled well. She just didn't have the pace of uh, the winner. She then absolutely bolted up at Pontefract, where she beat her former stablemate, Let's, with Dubai Love back in third, so she holds her. And I think what's interesting, Ken Condon thought she was good enough to come to Ascot last year, um, and she ran very well. But Ken Condon, he's very, uh, he doesn't overdo it with his horses. They can improve with time and experience. And Danny Tunnup said after last day, which is backed up by how well she won when she was ridden prominently at Pontefract, that she's improved a lot this year. If she improves another little bit, I don't think there's an awful lot of pace in this race. I think whoever rides may be able to get the run of things with her. And if she is improving, she's rated 104. She's very tactically versatile if somebody else takes her on uh, I think she's really really solid Okay that's a confident vote there for Thunder Beauty I've got to give a shout to Jumbly though for Holly Doyle and Harry and Roger Charlton impressive last year at Newbury and met all sorts of trouble in the German 1000 guineas last time out so Jumbly back on domestic shores also needs a shout out uh, next up is the £150,000 Moe and Shandon International Stakes ultra competitive handicap over the seven furlongs Oh, off at three o'clock and your current market leader is Jumbi. You ran a screamer last time out uh, when third. Holly Doll at Royal Ascot, that was nine to two. You've then got the likes of Dark Shift at six to one, seven to one for air to air. Also in there is at 10 to one tactical and then much bigger prices about the rest. 12 to one for Ross Collin, bless him, 14 for Aratus and bigger the remainder. Ultra competitive, Johnny. Uh, we still obviously don't have the final decks, but anything at this stage which makes appeal from an anti-post perspective? Yeah, ultra competitive, um, Dan. I'd probably give Fresh one more chance. You know, he was so well back to Royal Ascot. Uh, whether whether six or seven is his ideal trip, it's hard to know. He didn't run that badly. He's a far bigger price here. Um, won't mind if there is a little bit of rain. Very ground versatile. And just on the base of price, I'd probably give him one more chance back over the seven. OK, Fresh as big as 11 to 1 with William Hill, but as short as sevens with Labrooks. Ed, what about yourself? Yeah, yeah, I'm absolutely uh, I'm with Fresh here. Who, a horse who's probably not won as much as his raw ability entitles him to. I think he's won from 11 on turf or something like that off the top of my head. So he, he's been a consistent sort. He's running in some of these big races. And as you say, the Wokingham uh, from Royal Ascot kind of holds the key to this race, isn't it? You've got Jumby towards the top of the market and a few others in here uh, popping up. But you've got to remember Fresh. I mean, he met all sorts of carnage in running in the Wokingham, as you'd expect. Whereas Ryan Moore on Rohan 
weaved the magic line through to the finish line. I mean, it, again, it was bumper carts for fresh. He got knocked all over the place on more than one occasion, went for a gap and the door closed. And uh, I mean, he, the, he was totally undone by the draw as well with hindsight, wasn't he? He was in stool seven on that occasion, finishing ninth. Everything in front of him was drawn high. You know, they're all drawn up in the 20s and 30s. He was on the wrong side of the track. I think you could probably upgrade that performance given uh, he got smashed a bit in the actual running. And uh, again, I think the draw was against him. So in hindsight, I think it's a pretty good run. I think the step back up to seven is probably going to do. I, th I, th I think he's a six and a half furlong horse, <laughs> for want of a better phrase. I think seven is probably going to help him now, especially if he wants to come from off the pace. If he does meet a little bit of early trouble, it just gives him a little bit more time to get himself organised. And yeah, I do think it was a really good run in the Wokingham, all things considered. Back up to seven here. And Johnny makes the point about the price. He was four to one to win the Wokingham. Uh, I think this will dilute and cut up a little bit. And he's going to be, well, he's well, nearly three times the price to win a lesser race, in my view. So from that rather layman's logic, it doesn't make any sense at all to me. Uh, when I did the tissue for him, I had him nearer a kind of uh, five to one, 11 to two poke. So, yeah, fresh for me. I think there were valid excuses last time out. There won't be any here today. He's got to start delivering on the track. But I think everything is going to be in place for a big run. So, yeah, 11 to one, I think it's a cracking each way play. OK, two confident picks for fresh then for Kieran Schumark and James Fancher. Of course, at the time of recording, we'll find out the draw in the next couple of days. But also one to keep a note on then is fresh at 11 to 1 in the Moe and Shandon International Stakes. Well, next up, of course, is the King George. And before we preview the King George, just a reminder to check out Racing Weekly. Uh, the guys, Rishi Basad and Sam Turner, this week discussed a whole range of to topics, including the new whip ruling. But they also mentioned Emily Upjohn who was rerouted to the King George after a flight was cancelled when she was going to take in at the Irish Oak. So do make sure to subscribe and like Racing Weekly on YouTube and check out some interesting insight from Rishi and Sam. Just before we have a look at the race, guys, the King George, Johnny, start with you. You know, it's a midsummer highlight. You get three-year-olds taking on the older horses. Any particular fond memories of King George's down the road? Yeah, it's it's a uh, it's a cracking race, and you know the the fact that Emily Upjohn comes here after missing her flight um, is is interest. We've had Enable winning the race uh, three times, and it is as you say, bringing those older horses uh, to meet the, the the established sort of mile and a half horses. Um, I remember Tagruda's win for John Gosling. That, I mean, that's already twenty fourteen. Some some really good renewals here. Just looking back, Highland Reel was Aidan O'Brien's last winner in the race. He's He's had a bit of a barren spell, and it'll be interesting going forward. He doesn't really have proper middle distance horses right now. He could have Luxembourg, but he's injured. So we have Broom as his only representative here, who was well beaten in the race last year. Um, at the crack and crack and race, and all the better for Emily Upjohn this year as well. What about yourself, Ed? We just already spoke about some of them great winners. You've had an able win it three times. Anything yeah. that really sticks out? Uh, I'll go back a little bit longer ago, but I'm obviously Monsieur going back a long time ago was obviously electric. But um, more recent times, just for the wow factor, I think it was 2010 uh, when Harbinger won it. I couldn't believe what I was watching. Uh, you had workforce, didn't you? You broke the track record in the derby and um, this didn't see which way Harbinger went. <laughs> it was ridiculous. Uh, absolutely romped home, was it? 11, 12 lakes. Uh, spectacular performance. Never got anywhere near that. And then I think subsequently got injured, didn't he, afterwards? But just one of those... Uh, just mind-bogglingly good performances where it was it was a high-class field and he, he just absolutely spread eagle with them. I think it was Olivier Pellier coming in for the spare ride that day, uh, as he says, the best spare ride he's ever picked up. 11-length 11, 11 winner of a King George. You've only got to look at the list. Nijinsky, Mill Reef, Brigadier Gerard, Grundy, Sugar, of course, in 1981, Dancing Brave, Reference Point, yeah, Lam Lamtara, of course, Monju, Galileo, beating Fantastic Light in that brilliant finish. Then I've already mentioned the likes of Conduit, Harbinger, Nathaniel. And Daydream, of course, is an interesting mm. runner based on this year's event, the German winner back in 2012. I think maybe we'll start with just with Torquay Tortasso, of course, the reigning Prix de the Triumph champion. Bitterly disappointing on his return when only sixth, but it was much more like it when winning the Grosser Hansa Price at Hamburg last time out, Johnny. Yeah, and it's, it's looking at the old winners there, Alan Shire, 20, 2003. I think that was the first time I watched the race. But this is interesting because if you if you look at ratings, like uh, you have a very short price favourite who has a bit to find. And as you mentioned, the German horse. I guess the thing is, when he did uh, shock Taranawa, you know, it was it was a rare thing in terms of how bad it was. It was proper, proper testing ground at Longchamp. Came good the last day, um, obviously winning on home turf. Uh, I just would imagine that he'd be vulnerable here. He's he's obviously at least put the 
the bad and bad run behind him. But you'd imagine on the balance of form that uh, he's coming up against horses here that will just be superior on the ground and might just have too much pace for him. Ed, what, what are your thoughts? I should have mentioned the 2013 winner, of course, is also German, novelist. Yeah, indeed. I, I'm, I'm not 100% sure he's going to run. To be honest with you, the time recording. I mean, you listen to Connection saying they like to see the word soft somewhere in the going description. Um, I mean, I, there are a few showers around after the heat wave, but I'd be shocked if we get anywhere near that by the time they go to post. And obviously the, the ground was like an Amazonian swamp when he won the Art of the Triumph. Everyone on Twitter, other than myself and Johnny, were on board, um, it seems, you know, when he won at 80 to 1. But, um, yeah, look, I mean, clearly, I, look, there's two ways looking at it. As Johnny says, on ratings and on what he's actually achieved as being the Art of the Triumph winner, there is an argument here. He's massively overpriced. However, is he massively overpriced? Because literally underfoot conditions dictate his whole chance, if you know what I'm saying. If that's the case, the ground's rattling quick on Saturday morning. I, I'm, I'm not a thousand percent sure they're going to run. I mean, they had an absolute deluge before he bolted up at Hamburg last time out, eased down. I think they called it good to soft, but some of the stopwatch celebrities that I speak to tell me that um, it was riding pretty soft on that occasion. So he could look. He's just a, a wonderful flat mudlark. Uh, and if that's the case, I uh, don't want to do him a disservice, but he might, as Johnny says, a, he probably might just get taken off his feet and not let himself down on this ground. And just, uh, you know, just got to be a little bit lukewarm on whether I'm sure connections will walk the ground early doors on the Saturday morning. But I, at the time of recording, I wouldn't be 100 percent sure he actually goes to post. OK, interesting. But here's the betting for the King George. And your five to four favourite is Westover. Nine to four, the biggest price you can get about Emily Upjohn with Sky Bet. Uh, Mishriff is around seven to two, of course, of a new rider following the ending of relations between Prince Faisal and David Egan, James Doyle aboard. Torquay to Tasso, as alluded to, as big as 14s. Broom at 20 to 1s. And maybe the forgotten horse, 25 to 1, as big for pile drive with PJ McDonald taking the ride. Johnny, come to you first for, for the Westover chat. Just obviously he was very impressive in the Irish Derby. Got a great ride by Colin Keane, who retains the ride here. Yeah, I was at the car. Um, I fancy the horse is um, pretty much went like clockwork for him. And uh, there was a, a little bit of a doubt about how the race was going to be run. There wasn't much obvious pace in the race. Only Tuesday represented Bally Doyle, and she wouldn't, on paper, have minded a mudlin race, even though I don't think the race was run to suit her. Um, I think this horse deserves a lot of credit because, as much as you know, he beat Pisbadil, and Pisbadil was an also ran at Epsom. I think Pisbadil probably ran his race in the Irish Derby, and Westover absolutely destroyed them. I thought Colin Keane rode him very well. He's a horse who's inclined to drift a bit left in his races, um, but he kept his whip in the left hand the whole way. The race was over a long, long way out. I think you've got to respect the fact that this horse has had two chances at a mile and a half. He's had one chance under Colin Keane. He's two chances at a mile and a half. The first one, he was desperately unlucky, probably trying to finish second, finish with a rattle, and he was just so authoritative at the Curra. Um, again, as I say, I think Tuesday didn't really perform and I wouldn't read into it too literally in terms of that Oaks form that gives Emily Upjohn no chance in theory. Um, so as much as he is um, a terrible price in terms of ratings and, you know, he's taken on the older horse here. I just really like the horse. I think the rest are kind of a bit of a much of a muchness, either thoroughly exposed or the filly. Uh, I think he'll beat the filly and I think he'll beat the rest as well. And I also get the feeling that he might be the sort of horse that the bookies might take on on the day because... Um, I think you might at least get six to four, Dan, anyway, but I'd be, I'd be happy with them. Colin King keeps the ride. Um, I think he's going to be a proper, proper middle distance horse and wouldn't rule, you out, wouldn't rule him out winning the arc as well. And Johnny, just on that, Colin King keeping the ride, I guess it, it's hard to jock off someone when you win a classic. Do you still think it's the right decision, though? Um, yeah, like, I, I, I think, I think uh, you know, Colin King is probably a superior jockey to Rob Hornby, but at the same time, um, you know, the... The explanation given for Colin Keane riding at uh, Epsom was that he was, you know, he, he he was the best sort of jockey available in Ireland. I mean, I doubt he's ridden in many King Georges. So if, if that's the argument, I, I just I don't really see why Rob Hornby wouldn't be getting the ride back here. So maybe there's a little bit of confusion as to what they're doing here with him. But they obviously like Colin Keane. He gave the horse a brilliant ride. Um, at Epsom in general, or at, Asco, or at the Curragh rather, I'd tend to be more loyal to jockeys, but it is what it is, and it's best of luck to Colin. He's, he's the best in the business in Ireland anyway. What's your thoughts on Westover, Ed? Yeah, the most likely winner, and uh, without wishing to re repeat everything Johnny said, I I'd rather back him at 5-4 to four than I would lay him at 5-4, to four, if you see what I'm saying. Uh, I mean, he was just pulverised the field last time out, and yeah, if you do take the Tuesday form literally, then this... Uh, 
you know, the, the Emily Upjohn's price is an absolute joke. <laughs> but um, as I say, Tuesday ran too bad to be true uh, last time out. So I'm prepared to take that forward for pinch of salt. But look, Westover, it was a, it was a fantastic performance. You could argue Piz Badil's let the form down to some extent. But look, Westover had that race sewn up uh, from a long way out, cantered in, into contention when Colin Keane pushed the button. It was, it was good night, wasn't it, in a matter of strides. And yeah, I, I mean, when Rob Hornby said... Uh, after the Epsom Derby, thought, oh, you know, I think there was a good chance I would have won. I, I was a bit like, are you sure? Um, and then, you you know, he did get a lot, meet a lot of interference in running, but then well, the manner in which he's kind of swatted aside his rivals, uh, the Curra, uh, you know, you'd like to think with a clear run, perhaps he would have given uh, Sir Michael Stout's horse a, a real race in Epsom, uh, albeit uh, I think probably uh, the, the right winner has won on that occasion. Oh, no, no I think Westover was the right favourite. I think he'll take all the beating. I said, I've already put a line through Torquay to Tasso, because I don't think grounds can be that one's favour. Emily Upjohn, I'm kind of don't really know what to make of her, to be honest with you. Uh, obviously fell out the stalls at, at Epsom and then things didn't go quite right. And then she's had this rerouted plane problem. She's coming here as a as an afterthought. Uh, one thing on Emily Upjohn again with the ground, Frankie de Tory's notes after the Musador I thought were quite interesting when he said, uh, I think he was officially riding good at York. And he said, uh, in his view, he was riding substantially softer and what they were, the official going description. And in his view, he thought uh, Emily Upjohn absolutely loved it. Um, she is a huge filly. She is massive. I, I think I made a comparison on another show the other day. She's she's like the old chaser Denman. She's an absolute tank. If you see her next to her, other fillies of her generation, she dwarfs them. And uh, I, I, I just think she's a filly perhaps would love a little bit of giving the ground as well. It's something to bear in mind. So, yeah, I'm, I'm probably against her on balance. Uh, pile driver's admirable. I don't think it's going to be good enough at this level. Broom um, kind of got given a brilliant ride. I thought it Royal Ascot. And you could argue it's perhaps a few points uh, too big at 20s in this field. But that seemed a little bit of bolt out of the blue. The horse had been held uh, in its, not, not at this level, but he'd been running pretty well in Group 1s and Group 2s um, without looking spectacular until getting the job done last time out. So uh, I'd have to question whether he's capable of backing that up. Mishriff is the bit of the almost the joker in the pack now, because on the official ratings, he's the best horse coming into this. Uh, yet he seems to find more ways to lose than win these days. You know, he's, he's, I think he's won one of his last six or seven starts. And um, I had to start to question whether the fires were still burning until last time out in the eclipse, where, you know, you, you can make a case. He was, the, he was the moral winner with the interference that he had on that occasion. So I think with Mishra for this, though, I'm still not convinced, even though he's five, he's a mile and a half his ideal trip. Is, is, mm. is 10 mm. not his best He's, this was over 10 furlongs, then I'd be uh, really taking note of him. So all in all, I'm kind of by process of elimination, just coming back to Westover, who I just think looks really exciting. He's on an upward curve, uh, is the one to beat. I, as a general rule, we go over a three-year-old in this. I just don't think we've got to the bottom of the well with them yet. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm Westover to beat Mishriff uh, as, as a tentative forecast play here, to be honest with you. But uh, I, I'd be disappointed if Westover was beaten. Ed mentions the, the three-year-olds. It is it is mad. I mentioned Alan Shire. Alan Shire was the last three-year-old call to win this race until a day or, uh, last year, which is mad yeah. because the allowance of £11. I mean, £11, you're edging into August here in the three-year-old campaign. It's a lot of weight. It's a lot of weight. And yeah. you're, all these older horses are thoroughly exposed in this. I mean, Broom was beaten in the race last year. I'd agree about his ride at Ascot. So it's mad to think it's nearly 20 years. There was an 18-year gap between Alan Shire and Adair. And we've had three-year-old fillies winning the race yeah. um, in the meantime. But, like, it's a lot of weight to get. And as you say, Ed, this horse is on the up. And the rest of them, to me, aren't. Emily up, John, though. Johnny, a, a quick word. I think they were in the Lloyd Webber colours. Interesting. Looks like they bought a share si since the second in the Oaks. Of course, they had to miss the Irish Oaks. What do you make of her? Obviously, she gets three pounds from Westover with the Phillies allowance. Yeah, so she's obviously getting a stone. Um, I, like, I, I backed her in the Oaks. It was very frustrating. And obviously, that form has worked out well between uh, Nashua's, obviously, performance in France and so on uh, since... Um, you know, I, I think probably a little bit of inexperience cost her on the day. She was a little bit slowly away. Then she was keen. It was a muddling race. I think if she ran against Tuesday again, she'd win. But, I mean, Tuesday Tuesday was it was a strange kind of um, day at the Curra Derby. Day. It was very windy. And it was hard for a horse like Tuesday to make the ground up with the wind. But at the same time, she was absolutely hammered by Westover. So I'm, I'm, I'm prepared to say... I'm, I'm prepared to say she didn't necessarily entirely run her race. But I think that collateral form gives you some indication that she... Has to improve, I would say, to be Westover. And, you know, as you say, she's coming here as slightly as an afterthought. Would have been a lot easier, you would have thought, 
taking on the Phillies uh, in the Irish Oaks. And um, will it, will a Mudlin race suit or who will make the run in here? Will Colin Keane maybe try to make the run in a Westover? Um, in which case his price collapses in running. And just finally, quick word on pile driver. I think the only one we haven't mentioned, Johnny. Yeah, pile driver. I mean, what are we talking now? Five years of age, and again, he's another horse that uh, would have his chance. He didn't. He didn't run badly at all the last day. Again, you'd imagine he's pretty exposed. That's uh, Carnation Cup form. Um, it's actually probably fair. Fair enough. Again, he does look like a horse, so that would probably need to find improvement from somewhere. And um, be be great to see connections win a race of this nature, but. Uh, You'll probably get worse twenty-five to one chances. I do. I do wonder um, tactically how it'll work out. Is there a possible chance he will get a soft lead? In which case, uh, it'd be interesting to see what PJ McDonald does. But he's probably a little bit overpriced. Okay, that's a look at Paul Driver as well. Just finally, then Ed, you're confident with West over here. Yeah, I'll go in Westover uh, to beat Mishriff. Um, but again, Westover, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty confident. I'd say five to four. I say, uh, you know, on the straight line through Tuesday, this should be... Either Emily Upjohn should be a lot bigger here or Westover should be shorter. Or something's not quite adding up to me. Um, maybe people are slightly forgiving of the Tuesday form line from last time out. And perhaps, as Johnny says, more it may pay more to look at like Nashua. Uh, obviously, he was behind her has come out and, and, and won since and boosted that form. But all in all, it feels a little... It is, it is an afterthought for Emily Upjohn. Um, Westover, this has been the target since... Uh, since he won at the Curra. Uh, Rafe Beckett team absolutely flying. Colin Keane obviously he gets on well with the horses. We saw evidence on the track last time out. So, yeah, uh, as far as five to four favourites go, I think Westover's pretty solid. OK, and Johnny, you're in agreement with Westover? Yeah, same. And I think you'll get bigger than five to four in the day. I think it's one of these uh, races where there will be a bit of a disagreement among bookmakers. They'll want to, they'll want your money so they can kind of potentially roll it over later in the card. It's a busy weekend of sports. Yeah, I, I'd be very, very much. I, 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 I was strong on him for the Irish Derby, and uh, I'm not sure if he's much more to do here. Okay, Westover for Colin Keane, Rafe Beckett, and Judmont. Can he emulate Adiar with another success for a three-year-old in the King George? 410 is the Flexjet Paladary Stakes. We've also got the Porsche Handicap and the Garrard Handicap at 520 and 445, respectively. Any other business, chaps, or, or is that enough for Ascot on Saturday for you? Ed? No, yeah, I'm off to get myself a, um, a diet lemonade after that. I'll be, I'll be done for the day. Um, optimistically, might fire up the barbecue. But uh, no, yeah, that, that's my thing. Yeah, so Zambak, Fresh and Westover. That's, my, uh, that's, that's Ted's trick, see, for Saturday. Zambak Fresh and Westover. Johnny, any other business? That's me. Uh, keep an eye out for a horse, uh, Starry Heavens, a filly running uh, at Leopardstown on Friday. Um, she's related to Alfred Centauri. She's actually by Master Craftsman and Jessica Harrington's horses. Their form is unbelievable. Um, so that's um, another, another really strong maiden at Leopardstown. And I think she's a great chance. That's on the, uh, on the Thursday. And before I do quickly wrap up, Johnny, I mean, from a journalistic point of view, the King George, do you think it's it's quite a weak Renault for, for some we've seen down the years? What do you make of this year's race? Yeah, well, you, you look at, I mean, the winners, as I say, like going back to Manju, Galileo, uh, even Dylan Thomas, uh, Duke of Marmalade, when you had the brilliant Enable, it's OK. I mean, we have a horse who was third in the Derby against a horse who was second in the Oaks dominating the market. So there you are. I mean, there probably are a, a lack of... Um, you know, with a couple of high profile injuries in terms of the three year old Coles at the moment. Um, the, the, the older horse here is a bit of an is what they, they, they are what they are at this stage. So it's it's an OK renewal. I mean, we, we're not long since the eclipse. Um, I mean, there's only one horse coming from that race running in it. We had the Irish Oaks last weekend. Sometimes there are just other options for other horses. And it's, it's an OK renewal, I would say, at best. OK, that's the Group 1. King George VI, Van Quinn, Elizabeth Kipco stakes off at 3.35, the feature of the action at Ascot on Saturday. And the guys are both very sweet on Westover for Rafe Beckett. Lots more, of course, to come. The Odds Trick Betting Podcast will be back next week for Goodwood and Galway. Lots to look forward to. Could it be Stradivarius's last run in the Goodwood Cup? Lots more to look forward to. And make sure you check out the Odds Checker app. Andy Holding and many others will be giving you their best bets for all of the weekend action. Johnny, Ed, thanks very much for your time and enjoy the action this weekend. Thanks, guys. Cheers, Danny. Cheers, everyone.